All right, let's get started. So uh, in this lecture, we're going to dive into the details of how we actually achieve isolation, which has been a building block that uh, we've referred to in many lectures for building secure systems. Uh, but the case study we have uh, for today, the paper you guys have read, is uh, a, f a paper by some engineers at Amazon that describes what it took for them to engineer a strong isolation system for uh, one particular service that AWS runs, which is their Lambda uh, service for running uh, basically Linux applications on Amazon's uh, platform. So to give you some sense of uh, what, what's going on in this Lambda service that maybe required something new from them, um, the sort of classical thing that Amazon has offered and many other cloud providers have offered for a while is the ability to run virtual machines and the cloud provider provides some kind of a host that's going to run these virtual machines for you. And you might run many virtual machines. If you need many of them, you'll create a bunch. The cloud provider will run them across a number of machines. So <clears throat> this is a fairly standard way to allow customers to run code on a cloud provider's platform or server, um, but Lambda looks a little bit different, which gives rise to some of the requirements that this paper looks at. Um, so Lambda really looks much more like an application, like a binary you ship to Amazon instead of a virtual machine that you manage. So Amazon might have many applications from many different customers that want to use Lambda. And the difference is that Amazon is in charge of starting and running these application binaries for you. These Lambda applications are really just like Linux programs that you give to Amazon. And it's actually going to be Amazon's job to start these things on a whole bunch of hosts. And it might be that this app is popular, so Amazon runs it three times so that it can handle a large load. Other apps are maybe not so popular. Maybe they're only running once or not at all if it's not currently being used. So one nice thing about this is that Amazon is in charge of managing the uh, machines uh, and sort of operating systems that are running these applications. Um, but this sort of gives rise to some of the constraints you saw in this paper where they worry a lot about not only getting strong isolation, but also low overheads, being able to start and stop these on demand. And partly this is because typically a customer would otherwise buy a whole VM, and that's all they get. And they can maybe buy two VMs if they want, or three. That's sort of a big unit, and the customer pays for the overhead, if you will. And here Amazon is really uh, paying for the overhead, so to say. And uh, they really wanted to have a low overhead way of isolating machines. And uh, the sort of question is basically what happens here? So when you have one host being shared by multiple applications, how do you make sure that you can actually share that machine among these applications safely and without too much of an overhead? Make sense? All right, so let's talk about various ways they might achieve this goal. And I should say, this paper is sort of a very well done engineering case study of what it takes to build a really strong, well-designed uh, isolation platform. There's nothing earth shattering in this paper. It's just all really well done and uh, I think reasonably secure as a result. So there's not really uh, any great nuggets. A couple of you guys were asking, oh, like, well, what's the secret? Well, there's not really a, a secret. It's just a fairly clean, well done uh, design. And it's an excuse to talk about how you might build this and various design options out there. So it makes some sense. Questions so far? All right. So let's look at various approaches that you might take if your goal is to run many applications on the same system. So one plan you might start with is just to run them side by side on a Linux machine. So Linux is certainly able to run multiple processes at the same time. And there's user accounts. So you guys can all log into Athena dial-ups, for example, and you can run processes on that dial-up machine with other students and MIT people, and uh, works out okay to some, to some extent. So that plan is typically, you can think of as just processes in an operating system, and they're separated by maybe user IDs or user accounts in, a, in Linux. So it's one plan. Another plan that looks a lot like this is to use containers so you might actually uh, use a whole container. We'll talk about what these things are. 
So a container is a sort of complicated term that has many meanings in various ways, but the core isolation primitive that containers rely on is a mechanism called namespaces in Linux that we'll talk about a bit. So th these plans look both like this. Linux is running your applications, and you can either assign different user IDs to them or put them in containers. That's what these plans might look like. Another possibility, which is more along the lines of what this paper talks about, is that you have your applications that you want to run, and in order to run them in isolation, you're going to stick each one of them inside of a virtual machine, and then those virtual machines are running on some kind of a host, which might be Linux, plus some supporting machinery. So this plan is, as the paper argues, maybe a smaller attack surface, maybe gives you stronger isolation guarantees, and they, they worry a lot about overheads of this plan. Another plan that we'll talk about actually next week is language-based isolation. So instead of, so all, this lecture is all about operating systems and kernels and hardware isolating things for you on a single computer. You can also approach it from a language level and just write applications in some kind of a special bytecode format that's going to be easy to isolate. That's going to be the topic of next Tuesday's lecture on WebAssembly. But for now, we're really focused on these hardware and OS-centric isolation mechanisms uh, so far. So this makes sense, sort of the landscape of various ways in which you might isolate things. No questions so far? All right. So let's look at these isolation mechanisms so that we understand what's going on in them and why the firecracker guys in this paper chose uh, to cook up some new plan. So let's first look at how Linux processes work. So if you just have a Linux computer and you have multiple applications running on top of them, well, what you might do is that, all right, you got your Linux kernel down here, and here you have one application and another application running on top of it. You can run them as different user accounts. So in Linux, every user has a user ID, so maybe this is going to be UID 100, maybe this is going to be UID 101. So as far as Linux is concerned, these are two different users running on the system, and we'll try to keep them apart in various ways. Um, so let's try to understand what are the ways and why this might be a good or a bad plan. And what it sort of boils down to is that the reason this turns out to be tricky to do on Linux directly is that there's many shared resources in the Linux kernel that you have to worry about these processes sharing between each other. So the most obvious thing might be the file system. So you have something, you know, starts from the root directory, then you have maybe the binary directory that's shared by all the users, then you have a directory for app1, this is like slash bin, there's a slash app1, there's slash app2. All these directories are in the file system, and we need to make sure that there's some isolation so that one application doesn't get the other guy's data, but there's a lot of shared files. There's bin, there's other shared directories, one application could try to access the files of another application. We need to make sure this all works out well. So that's the file system. There's other resources, too, that you might worry about. So there's probably the network, stack, like an IP address and port numbers that's shared between these two things in the kernel. There's things like the processes themselves. So one process might try to debug another process or start another or kill it or who knows what. These are all things that the kernel has syscalls for, and we need to just make sure that one app doesn't tamper with another. Make sense? So how do we actually control access to these shared resources in Linux? I guess to some extent you saw this in the OKWS paper. So the OKWS paper came out quite a while back when mostly the only credible story was processes at the time. These other options weren't quite as well established. So you saw them making heavy use of user IDs and all these other tricks. So what's the plan for access control for all these resources in Linux? How do we make sure that applications don't tamper with each other's data? Yeah? Yeah, okay, so it's change root. We'll get to that in a second. But even the basic thing before that is really sort of for the file system, at least, there's file permissions, right? So each file has sort of permissions that say who can read and write that file. And one reason that 
turns out to be not a great fit for the kind of problem AWS was facing is that these file permissions are really set by the app. So what this means is that it's fairly easy for an app developer to make some kind of a mistake and screw up the permissions. So you might easily create some file like slash app1 slash, you know, some data. And if you set the permissions to be readable for everyone, which might be a default setting, well, now app2 can read it because, well, there's a file, it's readable, etc. So you might accidentally make it readable. There's also shared directories in typical system. So things like slash temp in a Unix system is shared between all the users and is expected to be writable. So it seems like a mess. One application can create files there. Now another application can't create them or has some conflict. So file system doesn't really feel like quite the right level for getting strong isolation. In many ways, this design that you see in Linux is really geared towards making sharing pretty easy. It's really designed for making it possible to share a single system and for users to exchange files if need be. So to address this problem, we saw the chroot mechanism that showed up in the OKWS paper to some extent. So we didn't talk about it then, but this seems like a good excuse to actually dive a little bit more into what chroot provides and why it's a somewhat better plan for getting strong isolation. And the way chroot works is well, so sort of on top of file system permissions. So we're still going to have Linux under here, and we have our file system with, you know, slash bin maybe, slash app1, and slash app2. And what happens is that every process running on top has not just a user ID, which it also has, but also has a root directory associated with it. So the root directory for this process, app1, let me use another color, the root directory for app1 might be this directory. And the root directory for app2 is going to be something else. So this is what chroot establishes. You can use chroot to set the root directory for a given process. And the effect that this has is that if app1 tries to open a file, say you call open slash x as a file name, what actually happens is you actually get slash app1 slash x. It's all relative to your root directory. Same thing for app2. Even though it might try to open the same file name, it's going to now get slash app2 slash x. And this is going to give us some pretty nice isolation between the parts of the system that each application can access. And there's not a way for these applications to screw up quite as much. If app1 creates a world writable file here, that's fine because app2 can't even get to it, can't name it at all. So this is why chroot, or this style of isolation mechanism, is in many ways more powerful for these coarse-grained isolation goals than just file permissions. That makes sense? Questions about chroot? Yeah. Uh, the kernel actually prevents you from doing cd dot dot. Um, so the question is, uh, if you're app one, why don't you do be clever and open dot dot slash x? And yeah, if you just did some simple string concatenation, this would get you out. But the kernel actually knows that the root directory is the root, and dot dot of this root directory is back to itself. So if you open slash dot dot slash x, you'll still get this file. The kernel tracks this at a level that's not just concatenation of strings. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Other questions here? All right, so, so, so we can get a little bit more mileage out of Linux process isolation, uh, but it um, doesn't quite get us uh, a way to deal with networks and processes. So even though we might be able to put different Lambda applications into different CH routes, they would still be able to share an IP address and port numbers. If one application binds on port 1234, another application can't do it now, it's going to break potentially. So it's going to be a bit of an annoyance. Yeah, question. Yeah, so chroot itself. So the question is, okay, what's the deal with bin? How do you make it? How do you put it there? So in the sort of thing that OKWS did, they just copied it. So they actually made a copy of slash bin here, and they made a copy of slash bin in app2 as well. 
So that could work. It's a little bit clunky. So Linux has a slightly nicer mechanism these days that lets you sort of mount slash bin into the chroot directory, make a logical reference to it without physically copying the data. Um, but indeed, you have to uh, sort of carefully populate it with all the data that you need. Indeed. Other questions? As usual, feel free to ask questions through Kevin through the website. Uh, but uh, let's uh, talk about namespaces now, which is uh, trying to address the problem, in a sense, that we talked about of other resources like the network and processes not being isolated in the same way as chroot lets you do for a file system. So the problem is, you know, even if I'm running in chroot, I could run ps on a Linux machine to list all the running processes, and I can see that, oh, the other guy is running five processes, and they're using 50% of the CPU. That might not be a good thing to reveal to every user of the system. We'd like to get stronger isolation than that. And namespaces are a somewhat recent mechanism in Linux that lets us do this. Basically, namespaces is sort of like chroot or scoping for all resources. So the idea is that we already have something like chroot for the file system. So, you know, we have slash bin, slash app1, and slash app2. So that's all good. But we're also going to do something similar for other things that we care about. So for the network, we're actually going to create virtual network interfaces, like, you know, v eth one and virtual ethernet2. These are going to be virtual network interfaces, and we'll give one application a copy of each interface. And then for processes, you know, we'll have a whole bunch of PIDs running around. We're going to organize them into groups. One group is going to be all the processes of one application. Another group is going to belong to a different application. So now what this is going to look like is that every application running on top has not just a root pointer, but sort of a pointer to everything it might care about and the pool of things inside of that scope. So there's going to be a file system namespace and for every process. And let's say for app1, the file system namespace points here. This is the part of the file system that this app can access. There's also a network namespace and a pros PID namespace. So here's the network device that this app can talk to. Here's the PIDs that this guy can refer to and so on. So namespaces are a way for the Linux kernel to configure the set of things in the kernel that each process can talk about. And there's like eight or so of these kind categories of kinds of namespaces that the kernel supports. And this lets us achieve pretty coarse-grained, st strong boundaries between applications as long as we set up these things to be disjoint from each other. So you might have another application over here, app2, that also has its own pointer. So it points to its own file system directory here, points to its own virtual network interface, points to a different set of processes. So you might see this is a nice plan for getting isolation and being able to at least specify the isolation we want. So without namespaces, there's not even a way to tell the kernel what should be isolated from, uh, from each other. That make sense? So this is the namespace mechanism. And this is sort of the basis for most things you see that are called containers. So what's a container? Container is basically something that uses namespaces to isolate applications. So, so container is really, you can certainly think of it as a container is basically like a full file system image. And the way you run a container is that, well, you set up your directory, so like here's your app. This whole tree, that's what a container is. It's like all the files from that application's root directory, including like slash bin for that application, all the libraries, everything you might ever want in that file, in that container's file namespace. That's what a container image effectively is. And then you might actually run whatever process in a container. It just runs as a process on Linux, but with one of these namespace pointers, I guess it should be green, pointing down at its own container tree and probably other pointers 
to the network and other namespaces as needed. That's roughly what's going on in containers is that it's like a fancy CH root. And one sort of non-security benefit for containers is that you really have no dependencies on any packages or libraries installed on the host system. So one problem that containers were trying to solve initially, it was not so much security focused, but more management oriented, is that if I want to run some application, it typically relies on a whole bunch of other packages or libraries or configuration files that might not be configured in the right way on any particular machine. So you install a Linux application, then you spend a bunch of time installing the right libraries. So containers solve this problem of packaging an application with all of its dependencies nicely into a file system image. Then you can just run it, and it'll more reliably work because all the files that ever cares about are right there. So that's one sort of management advantage to containers, and also partly, I think, why AWS was excited about it. It's a fairly succinct way for customers to tell AWS, here's the exact Linux code we want to run. You can run this container. It'll run reliably on any machine you set it up on because it's sort of self-contained. Make sense? And namespaces is the kernel mechanism that's responsible for typically ensuring the security of these containers, or at least the most common plan for ensuring their security, by dividing up, by sort of explicitly assigning a namespace for the files, the network, and other resources that the processes in this container should be able to gain access to. That make sense? Questions about containers? Yeah. Yeah. So, so LX, so the question is, okay, wh wh why do the labs use LXC? There's also this thing called Docker. What's the deal? So Docker and LXC look very similar at this level. Docker has many more features, like it'll fetch these images from you. It'll compose them together. It'll have a nice config file format where you populate the image and you plug in some config files into it. There's a repository website you go to all this stuff. There's some setup for these network interfaces. That's what Docker is really managing for you. And LXC is a much simpler thing. It doesn't really have a nice, you know, Docker file config format by which you build these Docker images. You just build the file system however you want. Use VI. Uh, build the file system, you're good to go. So LXC is a much more minimal layer on top of namespaces to implement containers, uh, which is why we use it in the labs. There's many fewer moving parts. Even as is, it's kind of complicated and sometimes breaks, as you've maybe noticed. But uh, Docker is quite a bit more elaborate on top of this. But in terms of security, they both look quite similar. It's all setting up a namespace and uh, plopping down some file system image here. So that's what's going on there. Other questions? Containers, namespaces. Yeah. Okay, so your question is, uh, you already have a home directory in Linux, and uh, you know, each user has their own home directory. Why do we need something more? And I think it sort of comes down to these two problems we talked about here. One is that it's easy to have a mis make a mistake in setting the permissions on files in your home directory. Or applications might create lots of files, or I, I have an application that is going to unpack a zip file or unpack a tarball, and the permissions inside the tar file are going to be applied to the files it extracts. Well, if there's accidentally a world-writable file in that tarball and it extracts it, it's going to be world-writable. Other applications might now write to it. So the answer is partly is that the application has too much flexibility to screw up. That's one story. The other is that by convention in a Unix system, there's shared directories like slash temp and slash bin, and they all sort of have shared files that you can't, you can't partition without ch root or namespaces. So that's the... I think the, the main answer for why you need something more than just file permissions. Question back there? Yeah, you can't list at all. Okay, the so question is, does chroot prevent not just open, but reader or other ls? And indeed, yeah, because you can't even name it. So there's no way. If you run ls, what ls does is it opens the directory and then calls reader on it. 
Well, once you call open, you can't even open the other guy's directory. So indeed, it's fairly all-encompassing. It's uh, not just reading files, but listing directories, creating anything. All file system operations are in that scope. And namespace is sort of, you know, see it through done right in some ways. It's much more uh, coherent, you know, in a sense, but you can think of namespace as generalizing C H root. Make sense? All right. So, why did the firecracker guys do something more? So why not containers? Or I guess I should say, right? Like they they have maybe sort of a, a flavor of containers that they're implementing, but why don't they like this picture? Why don't they want to use Linux to isolate their containers from each other? Yeah? Sorry? Linux vulnerabilities, yeah. So I think that's quite a bit of it, is that they worried about attacks that might compromise the isolation guarantees of this picture. So it seems like a nice picture, but there are sort of two ways you might look at this picture and decide that it's not really very secure. And it's really two angles of thinking about the same thing, of like bugs in the Linux kernel that the attacker can exploit to break out. So just to clarify, what we're talking about is that in a namespace-based isolation plan, an application might invoke some system call in the kernel that triggers a bug in the kernel's implementation of whatever is going on, a file system, a network stack, process handling, whatever it is. And if there's a bug there that the attacker can exploit, maybe like a buffer overflow, then you get to run code in the kernel, and then you can take over the whole machine, including whatever app two is doing. So there's two ways to sort of think of how buggy or how attack prone is a system like this. And the paper talks about sort of both of them. One, to, one way to think of it is in terms of an attack surface. And we've already seen some of these in earlier lectures too. And the attack surface you can think of as the different bits of code or different interfaces the kernel provides that the adversary or the application can invoke. So in Linux, there's a lot of different system calls, like 300 plus syscalls that an application can invoke. There's fairly widely used ones, like file read and write. Then there's funny virtual memory operations. There's network operations. There's shared memory, signals, processes, debugging, all kinds of syscalls. And there's other funny things in Linux called ioctals. There's sort of thousands of these extra ioctal operations. These are sort of special operations that don't get their own syscall number, but in a way they're sort of syscalls of their own right as well. So there's just lots and lots of entry points into the kernel that the adversary can poke by running an application inside of a namespace-based container like there. And each one of these syscalls or ioctals is a function written by some developer could have a bug in it. So that's one way in which these firecracker developers looking at this and saying, well, maybe this is not the best plan for security. Another way to look at it, which I think we've also seen, is that there's a large code base. So Linux is really large. So, you know, probably 10 million plus lines of code. That's maybe a aggressive counting in terms of including lots of drivers and so on. But even on a fairly narrowly configured Linux system, you're probably going to end up with a million plus lines of code in your kernel that you're running at any given time. That's a large piece of code. And worse yet, it's mostly written in C. So it's C code, and that means that fairly easy to make mistakes, as you've seen in lab one. So you might easily have a buffer overflow or some other kind of similar attack that lets an adversary corrupt memory. That's sort of embarrassing, but yeah, still, we have buffer overflows in Linux kernel happening pretty frequently. So by frequently, I mean like probably many times a year, you'll find a bug that gives you a, an exploitable vulnerability in the kernel like this. So this seems unacceptable to these guys. Like they, they can't have attackers compromising their service multiple times a year. That would be a disaster. Make sense? And sort of maybe the last argument is that, you know, okay, so it's a vulnerable piece of code, but the other part is there's no isolation inside the kernel. So in, once you get in, to run some code inside of Linux, inside the kernel, then 
you're done in the sense of having control over the whole thing. There is no isolation of different parts inside of the kernel's address space. So if I find a bug in the network driver, well, it can easily corrupt file system state or processes or anything. It's one giant blob in the kernel space in Linux. So that's sort of the line of thinking that I think is leading these Firecracker developers to decide that's not a good plan for us. They don't want to rely on this kind of isolation for containers. That makes sense? Question? So Docker takes a VM image. You know, Docker is complicated, and I don't exactly know how it takes a VM image. It might be, maybe it can unpack a VM image and run it as a container. I haven't actually run to this feature of Docker. Maybe Docker can also run VMs for you as well as containers. Uh, but uh, maybe, maybe sort of Docker has rebranded itself or sort of included VMs as part of its functionality. I'm not exactly sure. That's sort of a valid question. I think there's a bit of a separation between sort of user-facing tools like Docker and LXC and the machinery used to implement them behind the scenes. But certainly the initial way that Docker would run containers was namespace-based. And maybe they expanded themselves to also handle virtual machines as well. Question back there? Uh, ah, good question. Okay, so like one question is, all right, so Linux is large, it's a mess, there's no isolation, why don't we use a different operating system? I think the realistic answer here is an unstated requirement that we haven't talked about here so far, but it's really compatibility. So these guys want to run, it's sort of also the reason they reject language-based approaches. They want to be able to tell their customers, give us anything that runs in your Linux machine, we'll run it. And it'll scale and we'll run it as many times as you need. I think that's your value proposition. So it's not just isolation and low overhead, but also compatibility with existing Linux programs. So that's part of the, that's, that's a big deal for them. And otherwise you might be able to do some clever tricks we'll talk about next week here. Another part of the answer is that microkernels are sort of a, maybe a clever idea that lets you maybe structure the kernel itself to have boxes inside of them. That seems appealing, but in practice, microkernels haven't really worked out in terms of offering sort of full featured uh, platforms that have like a fancy file system that has high performance, high performance networking and so on. So the breaking up everything into a microservice has been a bit difficult to do as it turns out because many of the subsystems in the kernel have to talk to each other. And it's not so clear cut that the network and the processes and file systems are all separate from each other. Now, some, some things could surely be done better in Linux, like running drivers in isolation. Those have very nice boundaries. And I think there's some push towards that maybe in Linux, slowly. Uh, but I think on the whole, microkernels are just not mature enough. Like, I'd be shocked if, you know, AWS comes out and says, oh, yeah, we have a new kernel, you know, we'll just run this. Like, Linux has so much engineering that's gone into it that it's hard to beat in terms of performance and features and sort of correctness. Maybe microkernels are resistant to security attacks in some ways of separation, they might just have bugs. Like their file system if it loses data might still be isolated, but that's a different kind of problem now. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? All right. So let's talk about the sort of ways in which you might mitigate this. So one thing I want to mention is sort of a, before we jump into VMs, which is Firecracker's real answer to this story, is that there's a cool, well, Linux developers are totally aware of this problem, and they've been worrying about this as well. And one cool thing that they've introduced is a mechanism called seccomp-bpf for some technical reasons, but the seccomp mechanism, sort of a mitigation in Linux for mitigating this attack surface. And the reason I mention it is that it'll come, it comes up in the design of Firecracker in terms of how they isolate their design uh, or their implementation against possible compromises. But it's a clever mechanism. It turns out to be a good idea and is used widely. Um, so the idea is that we were complaining that Linux has a large attack surface. 
all these syscalls that an application can make. So if I'm running some malicious code, or code I don't fully trust that might be malicious, it's making these syscalls into the kernel, and I have a hard time defending 300 syscalls and ioctals, etc. So what Linux supports is a mechanism by which you can put in a filter in the kernel that specifies what system calls a process is allowed to invoke. That's kind of a way to reduce the attack surface. If you know your application isn't going to need all these 300 syscalls, you can write a filter that says, here's what it is allowed to invoke. So this filter, it's somewhat simplistic, but effective. Uh, so you can basically choose which syscalls. So you can look at the syscall number being invoked. You can look at the arguments to the syscall. A couple of other things, and then decide, is that an okay thing for this process to be invoking? And of course, this filter gets preserved if the application forks. So if you fork and create a new process, then it inherits the filter. So there's no escaping the filter once you set it up. So that turns out to be a fairly effective way to, or in some cases, it's an effective way to reduce the attack surface of a Linux kernel. It doesn't shrink the code base, but maybe if there's buggy code and there's no way to reach it through a syscall, that's okay. So this, turns out, this is one thing that gets used. And the paper actually talks about this as a possible strategy for dealing with the large attack surface. And actually, some of the container implementations out there will add a syscall filter on the processes running inside of a container to limit what syscalls they can make in a way to mitigate, and sort of as an attempt to mitigate this. But the paper sort of complains that this is an annoying trade-off that they'd like to avoid, because in their eyes, the problem is that this filter is placed on customer-facing code, or at least the way they would deploy it. They would have to put this filter on customer code, and they have no idea what the customer code needs. It might actually need any one of these 300 syscalls. So for them, it's really this kind of an annoying trade-off where you can either get more security by having a more tight filter, but you give up compatibility. So every syscall that you filter out is potentially more customer code that you won't be able to run. And now you'll have sort of a messy problem where customers will not be able to easily just dump code and run on your platform. That, and also, I guess, it doesn't get you 100% there because you still have to expose a bunch of syscalls that are needed in common use, and those still are potentially quite a wide attack surface by themselves. Um, but this is the one sort of thing to keep in mind, is just filtering syscalls comes at the cost of just prohibiting some applications now. All right, hopefully that makes some sense. These are sort of the process level isolation plans. User IDs, ch root, namespaces, syscall filtering. These are all mechanisms that are geared towards running processes directly on the Linux kernel, and then somehow coordinating what resources those processes are going to be able to access. Any questions about that before we jump into VMs? Kevin? So, question is, okay, does this filter look like the guard we talked about in the Google architecture lecture? So in some sense, yes, you can think of this filter as being some kind of coarse-grained guard. It's fairly coarse-grained, indeed, uh, but yeah, it's sort of acting as, it's interposing on all the operations you can invoke on the kernel and deciding if it's okay or not, but sort of in addition to all the other checks. And uh, it's not super expressive in the sense that if you have a system call that, for example, says, I want to write five bytes to file descriptor number three, that's the level at which these syscalls operate, well, all you get is write five to three. You don't know what the file descriptor refers to even at that level in the syscall filter. So uh, you don't have access to some information you might want to access to. So it's a very coarse-grained uh, way of deciding what operations are allowed or not. Make sense? Any other questions? All right. So let's talk about the alternative plan that the Firecracker guys embrace, and that is to actually run virtual machines. So VM-based isolation. So the picture looks sort of similar, except we 
stick a VM uh, between the application and the kernel. So an application sort of is just one, app, one process running inside of this VM. And here's another VM that we're going to have running an application. And all these VMs are going to be running on some kind of a host here that is implementing virtual machines. So in many ways, right, like this picture looks just like the cloud computing picture we were talking about earlier. And one reason why the cloud providers like this picture is that indeed there's something better about doing isolation at the level of VMs. And in some ways, it comes down to this attack surface argument. So it's really a smaller attack surface. in terms of what an adversary can invoke. So what's going on in a VM? Well, it's just sort of instructions in a virtual memory. It's a computer. There's no syscalls of the kind that Linux exposes. Or there's not read, write, fork, exit. Uh, there's not these ioctl. So many fewer operations you have to support, and they're perhaps more well-defined. And one maybe measure of this is that bugs in virtual machine monitors that let you escape are much less frequent than bugs in Linux kernel that let you escape. So we're talking there's probably multiple bugs a year that people find in the Linux kernel that let an application gain control of the kernel code. Bugs in virtual machine monitors are much more rare, it's like much less than one a year that it gets discovered. Like every couple of years you read about some bug and it's a big deal and gets fixed, but uh, much less frequent, I think largely owing to the attack surface argument. The code in, the in this host underlying a virtual machine monitor is typically still large. It's typically still a Linux kernel that's used to implement a virtual machine platform, but it exposes many fewer operations. And the effective code base that can be triggered by an attacker is smaller. So this is sort of the plan or the approach they adopt, but they don't like it quite yet. And, uh, you know, why not VMs directly for them? Well, they sort of worry about the start time. So they want to make sure that their VMs boot up really fast because they're on the hook for starting more copies of an application if the application all of a sudden gets a lot of load. So if a thousand requests come in for one Lambda function, they need to spin up more VMs to run that Lambda. And they have to spin up the VMs because they have to run in isolation. But they have to spin up those VMs on demand so it has to be the case that a request comes in, they almost can spin up a new VM right then and there just for the request. So it can't be taking seconds or a minute to boot up a VM. That would be too slow. So they want to be able to spin up a VM and handle a request right then and there. So it means probably like milliseconds and not seconds of start time. The other is overhead sort of related. For them, I think overhead means memory. So you want to make sure that it's easy to run, keep these VMs running in the background, partly because they might have some applications that are rarely used. But they still want to keep that VM running so they don't have to start it on every request. still kind of expensive. So it would be cool if you can amortize the cost. Start a VM, keep it idle because it's not using a lot of memory. And then once a second request comes in, you have the VM already running for that customer. And the last thing is that they sort of argue, well, you know, the VM is a good design. But in practice, virtual machine monitors, for us, still have sort of more bugs than we'd like. So they want, you know, even fewer bugs. So we'll look at where maybe these bugs come from and how they get around it. But they sort of always push, at least in this case, for having less attack surface. Question? Okay, so question is, okay, so how can it have a small attack surface if it's emulating all of x86? So part of the answer is that the hypervisor is typically not on the hook for emulating every single instruction. The hardware helps out with that regard. So for most parts of a virtual machine, you can actually just tell the hardware, hey, run this code. And the hypervisor doesn't actually have to know the details of x86 opcodes for anything that the hardware can directly execute. So you can just hand it off to hardware. This is one reason why... Well, hardware support works well, but of course requires the virtual machine is written for the same instruction set as the hardware. So 
the virtual machines are going to be x86 because that's what the servers are. And if you want to have lambdas for ARM-based code, well, they'll have to deploy a data center of ARM servers to go with it. Um, otherwise, you're exactly right. If you're running x86 code on an ARM machine, and the hypervisor has to implement every single x86 opcode, that's now a bigger attack surface, and indeed, that is more prone to be buggy. Good point. Yeah. Other questions? Of course, you end up trusting your hardware to do this right, but for whatever reason, at least empirically, your hardware seems to be pretty good at doing at least this kind of a job. All right. So to understand what's going on in a VM and why, what it takes to implement it and why you might have still a too large of an attack surface for the Lambda guys to like, let's try to talk about what is inside a VM and consequently, what would we have to do in order to implement it securely? So what's going on? What are the parts of a VM that we have to emulate? So there's, I guess we have to emulate memory. So the contents of all the memory from zero to four gigabytes of how much memory the VM has access to. Um, so that's one part for sure. We have to emulate the CPU state, which means that we both have to somehow, somewhere store the, the registers of our virtual CPU because that's some state. And we actually also have to implement the execution as you pointed out. So we have to emulate that. This side of the VM turns out to be relatively easier to do because hardware helps us a lot, as we'll see in a second. The part of the VM that often ends up being more complicated is virtual devices. So what I mean by virtual devices is that if you're emulating, like these virtual machines are emulating a computer, this is the CPU part and memory of the computer, but there's also all the I.O., that your computer might need to do. So we need some kind of a storage device, like maybe a virtual disk, or maybe a virtual file system that you can access. We might need some kind of a network device. We might need you know, USB devices. You might need a GPU for graphics. No end of these devices in some sense. And this is stuff that the hardware CPU itself can handle. It never handled this stuff. And for the most part, the physical devices generally don't provide hardware support for virtualizing themselves nearly to the extent that the CPU does. So the virtual machine monitor often spends a lot of its complexity and effort on dealing with this part of the virtualization stack. Make sense? So let's look at how you might actually implement a hypervisor to get some sense for what the Firecracker guys do in order to implement their thing in some kind of a better way. So we'll start by looking at how Linux KVM is implemented and how it splits up the functionality of a virtual machine monitor into its different parts. So Linux KVM. You guys are using this in the labs for running lab one and other code. So the virtual machine monitor that is typically built in Linux sort of split into two parts that goes sort of along the lines of the separation you see on this board. So the KVM part and the kernel handles this and some user space helper is gonna handle much of the device support. So what this looks like is in Linux, the underlying thing that's running directly on hardware is, of course, going to be the Linux kernel. So that's going to be down here. And there's some KVM component inside of the kernel that's going to help us take advantage of the hardware support for virtual machines to run them efficiently. So on top of Linux, you can run a special process that's a KVM process and one of these KVM processes effectively is emulating a single virtual CPU. That's what's going on. So in a VM running on top of Linux, it looks kind of like a special case of a process. It has the state of the CPU registers, and it also has the virtual memory. And what's going on is that the KVM code in the kernel 
is able to run this virtual machine process directly on hardware. And the way it does this is roughly that it sort of configures the page tables in hardware, which map the virtual memory so that the only memory accessible on a CPU is the memory that actually belongs to a virtual machine. So you set up the page table to map memory addresses 0 through 4 gigabytes to wherever the kernel placed them in physical memory. And now the CPU knows how to access virtual memory inside of that virtual machine. And then you can actually run the VM on the hardware. And the hardware will correctly interpret the instructions of the virtual machine. So what happens is that KVM takes a set of virtual registers and loads them into hardware and says go. And the virtual registers include in them what the RIP instruction pointer is. And the CPU just keeps running. And at some point, the CPU might hit some exception. Like maybe the virtual machine calls some instruction that touches a virtual device. And the CPU hardware has no idea what to do at that point because it doesn't implement the virtual devices. Or maybe the instruction that it tries to execute is one that the CPU itself doesn't know how to virtualize. So there's a couple of examples of instructions that the CPU doesn't handle in hardware and asks the software to handle for you. That's sort of an exception to the rule I mentioned before. And those cases are going to trap. So traps go to some kind of a helper. So if the CPU hits something that it doesn't know how to emulate, which is basically not just regular instructions touching memory, then it drops down into the kernel. And here, KVM doesn't bother implementing any functionality. It just sends it up to a user space helper. And typically, this is what QMU does. QMU is an emulator for all the stuff that the hardware doesn't know how to do. And QMU is going to get a call from the kernel whenever the virtual machine does something that the hardware doesn't know how to do. That's mostly device operations. And this takes the form of like accessing some device memory in the virtual machine that is not actually physical memory, but sort of a logical region of memory that should have gone to a device on a real machine. But here, the CPU is going to let the virtual machine monitor emulate it. Or it might be one of these instructions that hardware doesn't know how to run. The hardware just does not virtualize. Probably implements that instruction if it was not in a virtual machine because it implements every instruction in that mode. But inside of a virtual machine, not everything gets implemented. One example of this might be nested virtual machines. So for example, you create a virtual machine and inside of a virtual machine, you try to create another layer of virtual machines. Hardware doesn't support this kind of arbitrary levels of recursion. So if you try to create a VM using KVM inside of a virtual machine, hardware is going to say, I don't know how to do this. It'll give it to the Linux kernel. And then QMU is going to be in charge of figuring out how to implement nested virtual machines. So there are some cases of instructions that you do have to handle here. Since question over there. Uh -huh. So, okay, so your question is, you know, you remember uh, we had some trouble with some students setting up VMs in, in the class. And uh, one thing, you can actually run QMU without KVM support at that point. And in that case, it actually doesn't really use hardware at all. It just emulates every instruction. It has a slightly clever thing that actually looks at whole runs of instructions, like a basic block. So what QMU does is, as an optimization, it looks at one instruction, the next, the next, the next, the next, until it sees a jump. So this kind of basic block of code, QMU translates all at once and figures out, okay, these 20 x86 instructions without a jump, whenever I get there, I'll always run them in the sequence. So let me translate them all together and it does some optimizations and it remembers, ah, here's how you run those instructions. One advantage to that is that actually then you can run x86 VMs on ARM CPUs, for example. Uh, but the disadvantage is that it's slow. Uh, and uh, I guess whenever possible, you should use KVM for performance indeed. Yeah, so QMU actually started out, it existed long before KVM existed, and it was a full-fledged emulator that could run any software on any hardware by just 
translating. And then when KVM came into existence, its design was partly motivated by the fact that, ah, you could actually reuse quite a bit of QMU for all the things that are not so performance critical and just do the hardware supported stuff in the kernel. So that's sort of where the architecture of this KVM design comes from. Other questions? All right. So let's try to understand, I guess, what these firecracker guys do differently or what they don't like. So I think the main thing they complain about is that this QMU part is buggy. And it's sort of buggy for both these reasons, which is that like, there's a ton of devices that QMU emulates. It's not just a disk and a virtual file system and a network and USB. There's like five different disks that it can emulate. It has like five different file systems it can provide. It has like six different network cards that it can emulate and so on. And the adversary is free to choose which one it sort of wants to talk to, in a sense, depending on the configurations. So there's a lot of code that QMU is exposing in potentially emulating uh, this virtual machine. So that's, I think, a big part of what these Firecracker guys are worried about. And for them, right, the design is going to look pretty similar. So they have their virtual machine process over here. And this thing just runs the user code or what have you. And they, again, run on top of Linux with KVM support. And they just replace the QMU part. So instead of having QMU up there, they replace this with their own Firecracker helper that is going to take care of all the operations that QMU normally would have dealt with. So there's a couple of cool tricks they play here, or sort of at the design level. They really focus on minimizing how much stuff has to be here. Um, so one thing that they do is really limit the devices. So there's basically three or four devices total that Firecracker supports compared to probably dozens that QMU supports. So they basically support one virtual disk, and in particular, they don't support a file system. There's no virtual file system that Firecracker exports, whereas in QMU, sometimes you can actually have a virtual file system device. The reason for having a virtual file system device is that it makes it easy to share files between your host computer and the virtual machine. This might be the case if you, for example, want to run a virtual machine on your laptop, you might want to easily access the files from your host machine from inside the virtual machine. So you can have a virtual file system device. The problem with the file system is that it's, of course, a more complicated interface. You have many files, you have directories, you have variable length files, you can read and write, append, rename, lots of operations. Disks are way simpler. So disks, everything going on on disk is all about four kilobyte size blocks, and you can read and write those blocks. That's a very simple interface compared to having directories and variable length files and all kinds of complications. Maybe a little bit more to a disk. I'm not describing there's flushes maybe. So maybe there's like three operations. But uh, not a whole lot more. That's a very concise, succinct interface there. And similarly, they support basically one kind of a virtual network device that just lets you send and receive packets. And then they support a serial port, mostly for getting sort of debug output from the virtual machine. I think they also mentioned they support a keyboard or something, but that's, that's about it. So maybe it's plus a keyboard. Make sense? Question. Okay, question, does Firecracker modify Linux or do they just configure Linux in some special way? So this is the cool thing for what, why they actually can pull off this thing. Why can they pull off this plan with having very few devices? Well, it's because they're not actually allowing customers to run arbitrary VMs and have VMs ask for a random number generated device, a USB device, a GPU, all this stuff. They just allow you running Linux applications and they get to choose the Linux kernel that runs inside of the VM. It's not part of their security boundary. So if the customer gets access to the Linux kernel here, just to draw it out clearly, in their deployment, there's a Linux kernel in the VM, and then the app code runs on top of it. 
But if the customer compromised the Linux kernel inside of their VM, they don't really care. But the cool thing is that they get to configure this Linux kernel to only use this exact disk, this network, and a serial port, and nothing else. And in a general cloud computing scenario, this wouldn't really fly for them, because customers might want to run a VM configured with a certain disk, or you know, a Windows VM, a FreeBSD VM, various operating systems, and they have to be much more inclusive in terms of the devices and the accuracy to which they simulate these devices. But on their platform, the interface for the devices isn't really the interface in which they're talking to their customer. That's not an interface they're guaranteeing. So they get to minimize it as much as they want. So effectively, they configure the Linux kernel in a way that makes it run on top of their minimal set of devices. Maybe they tweak the driver here to make it work, but my guess is that they just use an off-the-shelf driver in Linux, that they, it's just one of the drivers already in Linux, they just configure to use it in their setup. But I think this sort of setting for them is what allows them to pull off having such a minimal set of devices and still have Linux work because they control that kernel. Question? Oh, absolutely, security, yeah. So let's talk about implementation. That's a huge deal for them. So, yeah, why do they write on Rust? I think they worry a lot about, sort of separate from the design of having few devices, I think they get a lot from re-implementing Firecracker themselves instead of taking QMU and just, like, keeping these three device types in there. I guess one thing I forgot to mention here is that, also, they don't emulate any instructions. QMU emulates instructions, they don't. So, actually, like, one of the VM escape bugs that happened in KVM was because of this nested virtualization instruction that I mentioned. QMU does it, and in con it sort of leads to, actually, had a bug in there. They don't emulate nested virtualization instructions, so wouldn't have been a problem for them. So th this really does help, but let's indeed talk about their implementation strategy, which I think gives them also quite a bit of benefit here. So... How do they implement their code? So there's really, I guess, two parts to their story in terms of making a high quality or reliable implementation. I think one side of it is really reducing bugs, and the other is containing exploits. So under reducing bugs, I think, first and foremost, they sort of write it in Rust, which is a programming language that's sort of it's like kind of like C in some ways, but it's memory state. Okay, it's, it's like C in the sense that it is fairly low level. You get explicit control over memory allocation. You can access fairly low level operations in Rust. And as a result, you can write things like this Firecracker VM monitor. You could write parts of a kernel even in Rust. It's a low level language, but it's memory safe. What it means is that the compiler will check for you that you're not writing out of bounds on arrays. It has a very fancy type system of some kind that allows the compiler to do this at compile time instead of inserting runtime checks for the most part. So it's a fairly modern language. It's not super widely used yet, but I think it's getting to be used. You see it in Firecracker, Linux kernel recently added support for having parts of the kernel written in Rust. Uh, some Network code gets written in Rust these days for having both high performance and safety, etc. So I think one big part of their story, and as a result, you would expect that it probably doesn't have buffer overflows in the implementation of Firecracker itself. The other part of the story is that it's just small. So they probably were careful not to implement too much stuff, so it's 50,000 lines of code. So compared to QMU, I think they mentioned QMU is like more than a million lines of code. So they, they get a bit of mileage out of just simplifying and rewriting things with just the features they need. So that's sort of one, one part of their story. The other is that they really try to make sure that they contain any exploits that might happen. So they're thinking, okay, well, this firecracker part may be written reasonably reliably, but 50,000 lines of code is no joke. There's probably bugs in there still. Maybe not buffer overflows, but other kinds of bugs. So they actually set up various containment strategies for this process using most of the techniques we've actually seen uh, in the first half of this lecture. 
So they actually use uh, namespaces and ch root. So basically, they ch root that process for the file system. They use namespaces to make sure that it cannot access network devices that it shouldn't access. They use UIDs to make sure it doesn't run as root and doesn't have access to extra files. They actually set up a seccomp filter that limits what system calls that process can make. So they really are sort of worried both about reducing bugs but also trying to limit their damage. And one cool thing that showed up in the paper, if you guys noticed, was that they're able to actually constrain their Firecracker process much more than they would have been able to constrain QMU. That's partly because they designed Firecracker to not use too many different syscalls or kernel features. And I guess it also doesn't implement as many things, maybe. But they're able to implement much tighter filters like seccomp and other permissions here to make sure, because the Firecracker process is designed not to use too much. And as a result, if it does get compromised, hopefully the attacker maybe has fewer things that they can corrupt or attack further by compromising the Firecracker process itself. That makes sense? Other questions along the way here? I think it's a pretty cool story in terms of just like really good engineering of a security mechanism. Uh, nothing sort of earth shattering here, but it's cool to see that not only are these sort of good ideas in isolation, but you can actually make them work. And like here is what it takes, like 50,000 lines of code, you can run a pretty trustworthy virtual machine monitor. All right, questions about that part? All right, so one thing I wanted to touch on is I guess some of their, I guess how they actually use Firecracker. It's not a huge part, I guess, of the security story for us, but it's interesting to see nonetheless uh, what Firecracker is get, giving them and where they're actually using it concretely. So where does Firecracker fit into their Lambda story? So what's going on is for them, they have some kind of a front end machine or a whole bunch of machines that receive requests to run something in a Lambda. So it might be HTTP requests, might be triggers from S3 or some other database in their AWS platform. But if some request comes in, I want to run this operation on this Lambda. And the front end can actually, they have a special service, some kind of a, I forget what it was called, some kind of a manager service and a placement service. So these things together are in charge of setting things up. So if there's not a worker or, a, sorry, if there's not a virtual machine running the function you want yet, you can actually talk to the manager and the placement service to either find it or start a new one. And on the back end, what they have is a whole bunch of machines with virtual machines running Firecracker that are ready to accept customer code. So they call these things slots. So slots for them are just sort of virtual machine holes, if you will, like instances of Firecracker that are either running some customer code or could run customer code. And this manager can say, ah, I want to run some customer code in this slot. And they will use a micro VM, which is their term for a Firecracker virtual machine, to run the customer code there. And the front end can send the request directly there or to some other slot that already is running and handle the operation. And then the code can send the request back and the front end will reply. So that's sort of the architecture in which this Firecracker system gets used for them. And uh, the, sort of there's a couple of cool things they're able to do here. One is, I guess, we talked about they have their own kernel inside of the micro VM or like their own configuration of Linux in this micro VM. And that lets them boot really fast. So this thing, the, they have some fairly impressive number. They can boot in 100 milliseconds, roughly speaking, on their VM. So that's almost low enough that you can just spawn a VF, VM per request and the latency might not be horrible. They also have this nice trick where they actually pre-boot the VM before the customer code is supplied. 
So what this means is that even though some customer code is not running yet, there's already a VM that was started without any of the customer code in it, but it's already a running VM that allows them to amortize some of this 100 millisecond cost before the request arrives. So they have this empty VM image that booted up and doesn't know what customer code it's going to run yet. Then a request arrives. They're able to put the customer code in the VM there. It's already running and dispatch the request there. And this lets them further shave the latency. Uh, there's still some latency to inject the code, but uh, uh, allows them to uh, reduce this latency. And the cool thing is that the VM is, from a security perspective, it's sort of clean. You just boot it up. No other customer code has run in that VM yet, so it shouldn't have been compromised by anything yet. So it's safe to use this clean pre-booted VM image. Sense? Question? So where does the 100 millisecond come from? Or like, why is, it, why, is it, why is it so much better? I think it's sort of a combination of maybe this firecracker process being fast to start because it doesn't have to set up all these devices, combined with them setting up a kernel that doesn't ask for many devices. They just need to initialize a disk in a network, and that's it. They're off. They're done. Uh, so I think the performance wins in terms of a latency, I think are not maybe super firecracker specific. There, there are some startup of QMU that they probably eliminate, but I think a lot of this benefit comes down to them configuring the kernel to only have very few devices. I think most of the benefit from firecracker's design comes from the maybe security side and the memory overhead side. So on the security side, we talked a lot about it, but the overhead that they have is surprisingly small. It's something like three megabytes per VM if it's idle. So that's like tiny compared to, you know, QMU could easily have tens or maybe a hundred megabytes depending on exactly what state it's in. It's not really trying to minimize overhead. And I think them writing it in Rust from scratch with memory use in mind, they're able to have a hugely small memory footprint. And as a result, they're able to actually keep idle slots. So what I mean by this is that uh, they actually, if they, if you run a Lambda on AWS for some customer. Of course, they're going to spin up a VM and run your code. But then after your request is done, they'll actually keep your code running idle, or they'll keep your VM around, even though it's idle, for quite a while. It's like many minutes. And the reason is that, the reason they keep it around is that if another request comes in, ah, oh, they already have it running. They don't have to waste another 100 milliseconds of CPU time spinning it up. And by making sure that the overhead per VM is so small, they're able to actually make this worthwhile. If it costs 100 megabytes per VM in terms of memory overhead, they wouldn't be able to keep nearly as many things idle. Uh, yeah. So it seems to be a nice trick. Not super security related, but just like good engineering all around, yeah. Ah, so the question is, okay, so what if you reuse a slot? So this, this VM was running one customer's code, and then it's been idle for so long, we're going to reuse it. So at that point, you just kill it altogether, not reuse the memory, and start a fresh VM in its place. And this way, there's no shared memory or anything. It's, it's like you killed QMU and started a new QMU. It, its memory has nothing to do with the old QMU because you've allocated fresh memory and you zeroed the pages that you've reallocated. So... The, they have this notion of a slot, but it's not sort of a persistent physical thing that's a slot. They just kill a VM and start a new one, and as a result, there should be no leftover state between VM invocations. Question back there? Uh, so using the same VM for two different customers would be a problem because the security boundary is the VM isolation boundary. So if they stick two different customers in the same VM, that's a problem. Uh, but what the, the reason this works, or they, they never do this, of course, and instead what they rely on is the ability to very quickly restart a VM. So worst case, if they need to switch, it's 100 milliseconds. They kill one, that's pretty much instantaneous, and then 100 milliseconds, you're running someone else. And then in the common case, I guess, they pre-boot these things, so they notice someone's been idle, they pre proactively kill them, and start a fresh VM 
before they even know what code they want to run in there. So the next time you know whose code you want to run, ah, you're ready to go. It's even faster yet. Make sense? All right. So one thing we can talk about next is how good are they from a security perspective? How should we think about them? Is this a good design? Are they getting, I mean, in terms of performance, it seems like they have some goals. I mean, this is not a super performance focused class, but uh, they seem to be pretty happy with their performance numbers and they're pretty impressively low overheads, so it's cool. In terms of security, how do we tell if they're good? Any thoughts? Are they good? <laughs> yeah, back there. I'm sorry? Yeah, okay, so what, what would be actually, I guess, the weakest point in their system? Yeah, so maybe the, yeah, one possibility is, you know, this is probably some service that's a complicated component. Uh, how bad is it if this guy gets compromised? Could they just like get the state of all the lambdas? Well, not really, right? Like they don't have any access to directly peek inside of a lambda state. They get to maybe route requests potentially, although they don't really say. It sounds like maybe the front end gets to send the request to the lambda directly to the to a slot. I guess the manager could start the maybe the wrong customer code potentially, or give the wrong slot. So maybe the request, so maybe worst case, you would be able to observe a request you weren't supposed to observe. That seems possible. But probably you wouldn't be able to get any of the data that is inside of the VM itself. So if there's some data you're processing or some secret keys in there, that wouldn't necessarily leak out. So what else might you try to attack here? Yeah. Well, it depends on what you're using Lambda for, of course, right? But for example, suppose your Lambda has access to your S3 bucket behind the scenes. Well, the request to it might contain some data you're trying to store in there, but the Lambda has the keys to the bucket and those wouldn't leak. So it depends on how you set it up, of course, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Other places you might look for bugs here. Yeah. Uh, Ah, yeah, okay, so you're saying, okay, CPU caches and other kind of side channels. So these guys are indeed, yeah, they spend a kind of a surprising amount of time talking about side channels in the paper. Um, we'll talk about side channels later in the class, actually, to some extent, but uh, it's, it's possible indeed there's some timing variations that maybe customers can observe by running on the same physical machine and maybe infer something from that. Although, I was kind of surprised they're so focused on it. Uh, I actually sort of looked through the CVEs for Firecracker. Turns out there's actually three somewhat interesting bugs that have been discovered in Firecracker uh, since the time they published this paper. None of them are super sort of damaging at the end of the day. Uh, one of them was actually a bug in their serial port driver where they forgot to bound the size of it. So if a VM printed too much junk to the serial port, the Firecracker process would just keep growing and growing and growing, buffering all of it. That was kind of a somewhat silly bug, but indeed I guess for them it matters because memory usage could go up. Um, once maybe most surprising bug was they actually had a bug in their virtual network driver where they actually had a buffer overflow like error, which was kind of shocking because, okay, they're written in Rust. Well, how did they get a buffer overflow like error in Rust? And it actually showed up because the Firecracker code itself is type safe and memory safe, but it interacts with KVM in order to manage memory mappings for the VM. Those things are not managed in Rust. So as far as I can tell, they had some kind of a bug in how they manage the buffers in the kernel and in the virtual machine. Those are not inside of the Rust language. And I think there was some missing bounds check there that allowed them to, uh, or had a not super damaging in the end of the day bug, but could have been unfortunate. Yeah. Ah, okay, so one question is the uh, Rust uh, also you know, isn't entirely type safe. There's some parts of the Rust code that are not type checked. So you're right, there's actually Rust relies on sort of an escape hatch. You don't, the Rust compiler isn't always smart enough to figure out that you're doing everything right. So you can tell it, trust me, I did the checks correctly here. And uh, it's possible indeed to have bugs in the Rust unsafe regions. 
Uh, as far as I can tell, they didn't actually, none of the bugs discovered so far have to do with unsafe Rust code. But indeed, that's like part of the TCB here. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, it seems like a pretty good thing. It's hard to evaluate security, but I think the fact that they're able to uh, have a very tight sandbox and this fairly small Rust implementation probably seems pretty cool. It's interesting that because it's widely used. There's actually a, some data on a couple of bugs that showed up, but it's cool that none of them were super damaging. All right, so I guess in summary, isolation, again, every lecture it seems like isolation is the key to security. One challenge we looked at today in particular is the difficulty of getting isolation and performance and compatibility all at once. And it takes some careful engineering to get that done. And next week we're going to start looking at software-based fault isolation or language techniques that sacrifice compatibility, but maybe gain some of the other benefits. See you guys then. Yeah, so, okay, so side channels.